distinguished uh, panel and guests uh, from the Greek Embassy and the Cyprus uh, High Commission, uh, and uh, friends and members of the Hellenic Bank Association. It is uh, our pleasure to welcome you to uh, our panel event that we're organizing together with the Hellenic Observatory of the, um, uh, of the London School of Economics, uh, part of the European Institute. Um, I wanted to uh, start this uh, welcome address by just sharing with you some data that perhaps will uh, give some uh, give rise to a few questions for our panelists. Um, this is like uh, a survey uh, that uh, is being conducted by a London Business School think tank called the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. And I have uh, put on slide two questions, the, the answers to two questions. As you can see, the first one shows the uh, percentage of population between 18 and 64 years uh, of age who they see good opportunities to start a firm in the area where they live. And as you can see, when they asked this question, uh, Swedish people came up to 80% and Greece came up to 13.7%. So is the last two position, 13% uh, of uh, respondents show that they have or they see good opportunities. Uh, the graph next week shows uh, the percentage of uh, the same uh, respondents who actually say the fear of failure will prevent them from setting up a business. And again, uh, Greece has uh, the bottom two position with uh, 56% um, of respondents saying that they fear to start a business because they fear of failure. Um, is that something cultural? Is it because of the economy? These are questions that we all like to, to know and address, and it's very um, uh, important uh, for rebooting the economy to look into the three pillars of entrepreneurship, innovation, as well as um, competitiveness. So we welcome our panel and uh, Professor uh, Kevin Thurstone, the chair of this event. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lewis, and thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to this uh, discussion uh, tonight. It could hardly be more uh, timely in the context of uh, the expectation that come August, Greece will complete its uh, third bailout program. And even more timely, uh, this very afternoon, the cabinet in Greece is discussing the government's uh, post-bailout economic uh, plan. So our essential question is to consider how can Greece best establish a sustainable growth model uh, for the future? What needs to be done? And uh, what the priorities might be, what the reforms might be, how can jobs be created? How can the Greek economy undergo a transformative change so that uh, growth in the long term can be uh, secure? Now, our panel this evening uh, offers us a wealth of expertise and experience from different uh, sectors. Uh, I'm going to uh, invite them to make a brief 10-minute presentation, and on your behalf, I've indicated them to them very firmly that the maximum is 10 minutes, please. And then there should be plenty of time for uh, discussion here on stage, uh, questions from you uh, in the audience. So hopefully we can explore a number of key uh, themes. Our speakers probably need little introduction to those of you who are uh, Greek in the audience, but let me uh, explain who they are. And this will be the sequence in which they uh, will make their opening presentations. Dr. Vasilis Apostolopoulos 
is the CEO of the Athens Medical uh, Group. Uh, he's the president of the Hellenic Entrepreneurs Association. Uh, he's a member of the General Council of the Hellenic Federation of Industries, the Federation of Enterprises, SEV, in Greece and a member of the Greek Medical Tourism uh, Council, and a member of the Board of Greece Qatar Business uh, Council. Nikos Drandakis is founder and CEO of BEAT, and yes, I'm cool enough to know what BEAT actually means in the Greek uh, context. That is, as uh, I'm sure you, knew, you know, a leading mobile taxi application, uh, which allows users to choose and hail their taxi driver electronically without a phone call. And given the nature of London taxi drivers, who would prefer to communicate with taxi drivers electronically rather than by uh, physical speech? Uh, so Nikos Drandakis uh, created uh, the uh, Beat uh, company. Taxi Beat, as it then was, was acquired by My Taxi, uh, a subsidiary of the Daimler um, Corporation. And subsequently, it was rebranded as Beat and uh, is continuing ex expansion, especially in South America. Uh, Michalik Samas is chairman and the CEO of the OTE uh, Group, the largest telecommunications provider in Greece and Southeast Europe. Uh, since November 2010, it is a subsidiary of Deutsche Telekom. And uh, uh, Mr. Samas is also the chairman of the board of Telecom Romania and he's a member of the board of the Hellenic Federation of Enterprises, SEV, uh, since 2016, and he heads the uh, Committee for the Digital Economy uh, for that uh, organization. So, first of all, can you please welcome our panel? <laughs> and can I now uh, ask uh, Dr. Vasilis Apostolopoulos to make the opening presentation? Okay. Shall I stand up or...? Your choice. Okay. I will uh, remain okay. with you. Okay. Uh, so, Professor uh, Featherstone, dear Kevin, uh, thank you very much for this uh, kind uh, introduction. I would like to thank both the Hellenic Observatory and the Hellenic Bankers Association for the invitation and uh, congratulate you on um, putting together this uh, excellent event and uh, uh, timely discussion. So, interestingly enough, uh, last time I was in a lecture theater at uh, the LSE, was two decades uh, uh, ago. I was actually uh, was sitting on the opposite side of, uh, of the room. So, actually, it's only now that uh, I realize uh, the merits of being part of the audience. <laughs> uh, so, uh, in a way, uh, the topic of our uh, discussion uh, today invites for a short response. Uh, what uh, should uh, the state uh, do? If uh, we were at about to study a normal case, then the, the reply could be uh, easy. Uh, the state should do as little as possible, uh, allowing the society and the economy to grow and prosper. Uh, however, uh, unfortunately, this is not uh, the case with, uh, with Greece. As uh, we all know the, the Greek case, it was neither the banks nor the private uh, uh, sector debt that uh, brought uh, the country in the, in the brink of total uh, catastrophe. Instead, it was the enormous uh, public debt accumulated by uh, problematic, oversized, and uh, clientelistic uh, state. Therefore, exceptionally in uh, the Greek case, uh, the cure of the economic uh, illness rests mostly with uh, the government and the behavior of the political uh, parties and uh, the entire political system. There is no path to, to growth that uh, does not uh, require decisive uh, measures by the state. Not only in terms of uh, legislation, but uh, also in terms of proper and full implementation. Above all, one thing is, uh, uh, and needs to be crystal clear. Irrespective of uh, how the exit of uh, the program uh, will be framed, whether it's a clean exit or uh, tight supervision or enhanced uh, surveillance type, there are some uh, unavoidable preconditions that uh, will have to be met. In uh, some, the priority is to avoid, at any cost, a return to the past. 
The end of the adjustment uh, programs does not uh, mean that we can relax. In fact, we need to uphold our fiscal prudence and uh, discipline. To attain this, we need to steer away and clear from problematic and past uh, practices such as the clientistic uh, state and the political exploitation of the state as its apparatus by the political uh, parties. Additionally, we need to avoid any allocation of uh, benefits and special uh, provisions. Instead, we should be working on fine-tuning the best possible incentives for business so that they can develop, create jobs and invest. Furthermore, we need a political consensus on the very basic prerequisites needed for a sustainable and dynamic recovery. Namely, the lightening of the bureaucratic uh, burden, the fueling of uh, entrepreneurship, a simplification and streaming of the legal uh, framework, a smart uh, tax uh, reform with incentives uh, for new investment and the expansion of business, as well as clear and stable rules of the game uh, that are applied universally. In uh, my short uh, intervention, I will uh, look at what the state and the Greek private sector can do to help accelerate uh, growth and ensure a smooth, inclusive and sustainable recovery. The first step is around uh, the corner, the exit from the memoranda. On the one hand, it is clear that uh, the end of the adjustment program is uh, welcome. It is also clear, however, that we are quite far from the end of the reform and adjustment uh, effort. In truth, we urgently need a new national reform plan uh, of Greek ownership uh, this time and embraced by the whole political system that will help us maximize competitiveness, productivity, innovation, and exports of uh, value goods and services. All new reforms must be highly uh, targeted, aiming to unlock trapped potential, encourage investments, facilitate the opening of new business, reducing the, the risk, pave the way for new jobs by reducing the social security and tax burden of uh, firms, provide the, sp the space for a bottom-up restructuring of the Greek business map. Of course, as well, we need to attract and repatriate uh, talent, uh, some of which is present here today in this room. It is, I think, the epicenter of uh, resynthesizing the country so that we invite and we attract the Greek talent back. So while top-down uh, support, uh, incentives, and other facilitations are welcome, in the end of the day, the execution of the plan must be entrusted with a private uh, enterprise, the animal spirits, entrepreneurial vision and managerial efficiency. We effectively know uh, what we need uh, to do to go forward. We have uh, largely known actually this uh, since the very start of uh, this crisis. All we need is to focus on our comparative advantages, invest smartly, diversify, advanced uh, greater interconnectedness uh, between our different productive sectors, advanced smart domestic and international synergies, build economies of scale, maximize our competitiveness, as well as our exports of final goods with high added value. So agro-tourism and education are two uh, characteristic examples of, uh, of this. Having said uh, all that, it uh, may shock uh, some of you uh, that in spite the numerous uh, challenges, contradictions and irregularities that the Greek uh, case continues to present, I am fairly optimistic regarding the outlook of the Greek economy and uh, the prospects of, uh, of our country. <laughs> The recent progress of uh, several uh, major investments, uh, major both in, um, in size uh, but uh, of symbolic uh, significance, is a positive indeed and encouraging uh, signal uh, globally. So from Elinikon to Atalandi uh, Hills, from uh, Tesla and Samsung uh, R&D centers in Greece 
to the far-reaching infrastructure investments currently underway. So with uh, uh, actually 69 investments uh, in a total budget in excess of uh, uh, 21.4 billion, the Greek outlook uh, in, uh, in the map uh, is uh, shifting again. Furthermore, according to latest uh, data, exports are on the rise uh, again, marking an uh, approximately 13% uh, uh, increase in the last uh, quarter. Uh, wh while there seems uh, to be increasing investment interest in uh, real estate and, uh, and tourism. So our economy is in, uh, uh, continues to be in dire, in dire need of new dynamic entrepreneurial uh, activity. New ideas, new firms, new synergies, new investment, new global partnerships. And uh, of course, we need uh, in many ways to have a holistic uh, uh, approach rebranding the country and smart uh, repositioning uh, of it in the global chessboard. Uh, so, in fact, how we are perceived uh, politically, uh, economically, uh, socially, it's uh, very important and very crucial for foreign investment, uh, market uh, confidence, tourism, negotiating power, as well as, uh, crucially, uh, our national uh, security, if one looks also at the geopolitical uh, side. So, dear friends, uh, we think that, I think that there is clear, uh, clearly a way and uh, we clearly have uh, the means. Let's find the will. So, Greece today uh, seems to be <clears throat> trapped in a rhetoric uh, a reform continuum, whereby we keep promising reforms, we announce them, and we even legislate uh, them with some pressure, and then the long, uncertain wait begins. Uh, and of course, uh, we need to see which of these reforms uh, will actually be implemented and how will it implement it, um, uh, etc. So, going back to the rebranding uh, uh, issue, we need to work uh, collectively and uh, methodically and uh, to make the transition, a clear transition, from the Greek crisis to the Hellenic growth, recovery, and prosperity. A, recon a reconceptualized, a powerful European state at this pivotal southeastern corner of the Mediterranean. So I warmly suggest to drop uh, the name Greece and adapt the name Elas. After all, it's the Hellenic uh, Observatory, it's the Hellenic Bankers Association, it's the Hellenic uh, Alumni, it's... Uh, <laughs> the Hellenistic period. <laughs> and uh, the Philelines, because I know, Kevin, you are on a, one of them. Uh, so uh, we have a good uh, landmark uh, ahead of us. It's the 2021, where we're going to celebrate the 200 years since the Greek War of, uh, of Independence. So we need to work hard uh, by then, with rapid growth, a degree, of course, of political consensus, and then sense of common purpose among the people, among us. So a lot of work is needed, but uh, the challenge for a rapid, sustainable, and inclusive growth is only just beginning. And if we work together, we can make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Nico? Yes, sir, thank you. Is it working? Uh, yes. yes. Okay. Um, thank you, Professor. Thank you for the kind invitation. It's uh, an honor to be here because it's a place uh, I never had the opportunity to be and study. Um, I'm not certain I'm, I'm the right person to talk about uh, the problems my country is facing and financial crisis and everything else. I'm not a politician. I don't have the you know the bigger picture on what the real problems are from many different <coughs> angles of the problem. Uh, but I may have a point of view on what it takes uh, for my broader industry. You know, I, I belong in the technological innovation entrepreneurship uh, industry. 
and um, what it takes to grow as an ecosystem, uh, our industry, and contribute more uh, to the Greek economy. And I have the feeling that the problem I am facing in growing my company um, is related in a big way and is very close to the problems that the Greek economy is facing in growing. Now, I know what many of you would think that uh, what the biggest problems uh, are for my company. Uh, no, it's not the spirits and it's not the Greek regulators who are chasing my company. Uh, my biggest problems have to do with, uh, you know, our company relies mostly on developing big data uh, systems and automations. Uh, we rely a lot to invest in the future and be competitive in building uh, smart systems in the back end. And for this reason, you know, we need many, many engineers uh, in advanced technologies. We need big data engineers. We need data scientists. We need uh, uh, experts on machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now, um, we're struggling to hire enough people uh, in the company because our development hub is, is in Greece, our engineering hub. And uh, the, the truth is that there isn't uh, just enough, you know, talent pool in Greece to support this operation for us. And this is our bigger, biggest problem right now because we want to be competitive. We expand internationally. We have very big uh, competitors. And we can't just, you know, support our uh, uh, product development uh, from Greece. M this happens because most of the Greeks who can work on advanced te technologies have left the country. Some of you may be here, uh, or you, know, you may know already many who live here. And um, that is why brain drain, I think, is a big deal for the country right now. Uh, if we do not have the, the human capital to support um, and grow companies like mine, then Greece will never be part of the fourth uh, industrial revolution, which is already happening. That's a big deal for me, for the country. And uh, I think if it happens, the ship will keep sinking, uh, and, but maybe for reasons different than uh, the reasons it ha started sinking uh, about 10 years ago. And this way, I think maybe we will turn our attention again in growing an economy on more traditional, tried and true, you know, sectors like agriculture or tourism or uh, low value services, but this way, I think, will make our economy a third-rate economy in the global competition. So what can we do uh, ahead of this challenge? From my perspective, at least, I think we have a number one priority for us to do three things. Retain talent, whatever has uh, stayed in the country. Uh, get, uh, get back the talent that fled the country in the last years. And third, why not? Uh, cause brain drain in other countries and uh, attract talent from, from other countries. That's what we have to do, at least from my perspective. And uh, the way to do, it, to do it is really hard because competition is harsh. I can offer just one, one example I have from my personal experience. And it was back in uh, the summer of 2015. You know, one of these uh, evenings when Yanis Varoufakis stormed his apartment saying to his wife, honey, I shut the banks. <laughs> and uh, what, whatever came after that, a few weeks later, the municipality of Amsterdam approached me, um, trying to con convince me to uh, get my company to Amsterdam, to relocate there. And um, they made my tickets to fly to Amsterdam for one day. And there was one person dedicated for me from early morning to pick me from the airport until early, uh, late at night. Um, now, we're not a very special company for them. We are among hundreds of thousands of companies that have uh, a certain amount of talent uh, interested for, for, uh, interesting for, for these uh, people. But it shows the amount of dedication and uh, importance they give to attract this talent. So they, this guy took me, you know, to lawyers, to accountants, to headhunters, to see what it is, what it means for us to, to operate out of Amsterdam. And he presented me many, many uh, incentives and uh, tax uh, incentives to bring the company. And these incentives also were based on how many people I'll bring to Amsterdam, how many people from my engineering team. Now, notice that 
these guys are not asking for capital investment. They never asked me how much money I will bring to this country, to Amsterdam, to invest. All they asked for me was bring our people. And uh, he actually told me that th Amsterdam right now is in fierce competition with four cities across the world to attract top talent, which is uh, New York, San Francisco, L London, and, and Stockholm. And this shows that they, they, they put the right uh, emphasis, the right focus on the real challenges and problems that the f uh, global uh, economy is facing right now. It's all about attracting talent. And then I think, based on my personal view, I think uh, uh, probably that capital will follow talent. Capital is following talent right now. It's not following um, maybe you know, tax incentives or financial incentives, mostly where uh, the talent lives and where the talent can develop you know, the technologies and the, and the products of the future. So um, I think that most of us, all of us, even our leaders uh, in the country, everyone knows uh, what's the right thing to do. The big question is um, how deep in our belief system exists the question, where do we want this country to be in the new world, in the new century? And um, it all comes with a, a number of no's that you have to say as a leader to small groups that have, have vested interests in not allowing the country to, to change and move forward. Um, so I think that's a big question. It's all about the leadership of the country, like it is all about the leadership of, of our companies or the leadership of our families, right? It's the same thing. So that's uh, how I see the problems we discussed today. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. That's a great example. Thank you. So now to Megali. Good evening, everyone. Before I go on, allow me to ask uh, two questions. The answers will help me to uh, see how, I, how much I should elaborate or not on, uh, on what I will uh, present to you. How many of you are non-Greeks? If you could raise your hand. OK. And how many of you are students? Thank you. So good evening again. And, uh, I will start by expressing to you, by sharing with you my belief <coughs> regarding crisis. There are two ways to face crisis. Lose heart, panic, become introverted, and hope for the best. Or keep calm, treat crisis as an opportunity, come up with a comprehensive and decisive strategic plan and get to business. I would like to contribute to today's discussion by presenting to you the OTEC Group's example and how we dealt with crisis, how we transformed during the Greek financial crisis our company to a modern technology powerhouse. I became chairman and CEO of the group in 2010. It was the year that the first MOU between the Greek government and its creditors was signed. At that time, OTE was trapped into a vicious cycle. Low competitiveness, eroding financial results, poor customer experience, fierce competition, and an inherited debt which, due to the Greek crisis, was at high risk. Indicatively, I can give you some numbers, the debt was at 4.3 billion euros, which was approximately 2.4 times the EBDA, which for normal financial periods, this is an average and a efficient structure. However, for the crisis and when the banks have closed the refinancing, 
this is an issue. Our personnel costs were over one billion, twice as much the uh, efficient European average of an incumbent. Our uh, service revenues were decreasing with a rate of minus 10% on an annual basis, and we were losing customers at a rate of 10% of our total customer base. Above all, we had also a hostile regulation, which very wrongly, instead of promoting investments to the country, it was stopping Otec Group from investing in order to protect the, the competitors who were not willing or were not capable to invest. So what did we do? What did we do in order to transform the company? As I said earlier, we treated the situation as an, as an opportunity. We came up with a very solid strategy, and we got to business. At that time, my team and myself, we saw the various aspects of the environment, the internal factors and the external factors that were influence, influencing our business. And instead of finding excuses for doing nothing because of the external environment, we decided, and we're determined for this, that we have to at least handle and manage the internal factors which we could influence. And at this point, I would like to stress the fact that no matter how good your plans are, they cannot be materialized or be successful if you don't have the right people. So having the right team of people is of the utmost importance for the success of any plan. We formed a strategy. Our strategy consisted of uh, six pillars. Technology superiority, best customer experience, new revenue streams, leadership in core business, operational cost optimization, and a modern human resources strategy. We changed more or less everything. And we, we did this in three stages. First of all, we fixed the basics. We had to fix the basics in order to secure the competitiveness of the company. We slashed our net debt with bold decisions like liquidation of assets, introduced new customer-centric philosophy, and changed all our customer-facing processes and systems. We improved our prices by cutting costs and inspired our people and tackled cultural change towards a performance-based organization. Having done that, having fixed the basics, we moved to the second, st second stage, which was a focus on growth. We invested heavily throughout the crisis on, fixed, on both fixed and mobile. We invested on an internal infrastructure, on IoT systems, and the total investments amounted, exceeded 2 billion euros during the crisis period. At the same time, we cut costs wherever we could in order to be able to continue investing. We built our brand and retail channels and created new prod products as well as entered new market segments like the ICT segment and the TV segment. I could go on for hours telling you of the various things we, we did, but I think for today's discussion, are covered enough. So having done all this, we achieved to transform the company from a fast bleeding telco with zero net ads in 2010 to a leader in broadband, ICT, and TV sector in 2018, today. 
So what, what have, has all this, what have we achieved with all this? Today, OTEA has secured its uh, sustainability. We, the 2017 results, which were announced a few months ago, uh, showed revenues of $4 billion, net debt down from uh, $4.3 billion to $700 million, Euros. a resilient EBDA with an EBDA margin of uh, 34%. In fact, our margin increase is at 40%. We reduce costs by more than 30% while delivering better services. This allowed us to invest in NGN networks and infrastructure, as I said earlier, of more than 2 billion during the last six years. And we have uh, committed plans to invest more than 2 billion in the next four years with the announced program of fiber to the home for 1 million homes, which is equivalent to 25% of the total households of, of uh, Greece. So in other words, today we lead the market. We lead in every segment we have decided to compete. Fixed, mobile, ICT, and pay TV. Most importantly, we have become the love brand with customers choosing services for uh, the quality we offer and for the experience that they have and not because of the necessity. However, as I said earlier, we, we have covered so far the two stages. There is a third stage, which is a very important one, which will take us to the future. And this is a new channel, challenge. So the third stage will deal with digitalization with digital transformation. So it's, it's a new journey. It's a new journey that we must take and we have to change for this gear again. No industry or organization could service without adapting to the new digital era. We have already compiled a very solid plan it's a 360 digital transformation program which focuses on preparing our business for the digital economy, embracing new technologies and services, embarking in a digital transformation that will affect customers, employees, and partners. Thankfully, continuous rapid adaptability and leading change has become a mindset for us. But with this, allow me to make a few remarks or comments about Greece, since Greece is the country which uh, most of our revenues are generated. <coughs> Greece has gone a, a very tough journey, has gone through very tough times during the past almost 10 years. However, we see a positive future, although fragile, but we see some uh, positive economic indicators to come ahead of us. A lot has been achieved so far with the support of our European allies. Still, the situation remains challenging. The most important thing for Greece now is a vision for itself, translated to concrete down-to-earth strategy, set the target, the target, determine the objectives, and follow with con consecutive actions. Greece, like Ote did, has to leave behind mindsets and proceed with reforms to make the country truly uh, business-friendly. Technology can be an ally in this effort, a lever for faster growth, we believe in digital Greece, and that's why we have to urge Greece and its officials to exploit the fourth, the fourth industrial revolution. It's crucial for the country, for its people, 
and for its businesses. For me, it's clear that this is the only way forward. Hotel Group can be a partner, a supporter to this direction. And since we have proven that we have managed to transform our company to a technology powerhouse, we can help the country to do the same. And we are there in order to contribute towards this direction. Thank you. Well, let me uh, thank each of our uh, panelists for those uh, opening contributions. I'd like to uh, start by asking some questions to each of you collectively, and then I'm going to invite you to ask uh, follow-up questions of your own. Um, perhaps I could start with a cultural question. When uh, Mr. Luizu uh, gave the data at the very beginning of our session about attitudes towards entrepreneurship, clearly in Greece uh, the survey was showing um, alarmingly low uh, scores. But if you were to look at the comparator countries, Portugal, for example, then attitudes towards entrepreneurship during the crisis years, as a colleague of mine has uh, recently been uh, reporting, attitudes towards entrepreneurship in Portugal during the bailout years went significantly up. In Greece, they went significantly down. This seems to be perverse. It's a crisis, good to take uh, opportunities from a crisis, as was uh, mentioned before, but it's also perverse in the sense that the, the Troika, the EU institutions, have precisely been trying to encourage entrepreneurship, competitiveness, and all of those things. So when we look at Mr. Luizu's uh, survey data, we see something of a, a, a strange contrast between uh, Greece and Portugal. Now, I don't want us to uh, become so focused on the comparison between uh, Greece and other countries. But I noticed that, Michali, in your presentation, you, one of the things you said about the transformation of Orte was that you brought about culture change within the organization. And uh, Nikos and Vasilis also mentioned about the importance of changing attitudes. Indeed, each of you, in various degrees, mentioned it's a question of will, a question of will. So I wonder how you would uh, suggest to a prime minister uh, in Greece, how on a medium term, perhaps a long term basis, uh, governments could change attitudes towards entrepreneurship to make public to make young people, uh, to make the most talented uh, young people in Greece view entrepreneurship more positively. Mikhail, do you want to begin with that? First of all, I would like to say the following. You know, governments, especially European governments, are very pro-social. They, they are very much pro-social, and that's why they, you know, they impose taxation in order to uh, redistribute the income of the of the rich to the poorest or to the ones who cannot uh, uh, don't have enough anyway uh, in order to, to to make sure that the social care systems are there in order to support the weakest and uh, likewise we have similar programs in our companies we have the social responsibility programs in order for a company uh, in other words to to be able to have uh, uh, large budgets on social responsibility programs the company there is a pre one, one rule, one prerequisite. The company has to be healthy. So first of all, and above all, governments, uh, the Greek government particularly, has to understand that in order for the government to have, to be able to finance the social care programs okay. that uh, it needs to finance for the weak, it has to be a healthy economy. In order to have a healthy economy, you have to have investments. It's okay. all part of the equation. 
Perhaps I should put it. Perhaps I should put it differently. The kind of survey that Mr. Louisou was pointing to in terms of attitudes towards entrepreneurship show on a long-term basis, pre-crisis and during the crisis, attitudes towards entrepreneurship in Greece being substantially lower than the European average in good times and in bad times. So I recognize your point about governments can, uh, governments should prioritize business-friendly reforms uh, before they can talk about social compensation. But how does Greece change the minds, the attitudes of young people who disproportionately in Greece feel that entrepreneurship is not for them? If, uh, okay, I will, uh, this is a personal lesson. I will try to, you know, we Greeks have, uh, have a, a problem, we, we, a problem, or in some cases positive, some, in some cases in, uh, in, is negative. We rely very much on hope, okay, which is, it's very good to rely on hope, but you cannot just rely on hope by doing nothing. It's fine to rely on hope, but you have to take actions also. So, if, let's say, someone comes, a politician, and usually the politicians, most of the politicians, you know, understand economics in, in their own way, and they, 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 they uh, play music to your ears according to the hopes that you have, and you believe this music, then you, you, you go into a trap. And I think this is the trap that the Greeks uh, fell from 2010 on. Okay. Because I believe that if we had taken the initial measures that were requested by the creditors during the first two or three years, the whole thing would have been over by now. Okay. Vasily? Well, actually, uh, Kevin, I, don't, I, I will not, uh, let's say, challenge the findings of, uh, of the survey, but um, according to my feeling and experience is that uh, the notion of uh, entrepreneurship is uh, on the rise within the a Greek society in the crisis era. All the other institutions like uh, the parliament, uh, the government, the political parties uh, were in the fall and uh, entrepreneurship, actually there was last year a survey published in Kathimerini, a paper exactly indicating uh, this. Uh, obviously entrepreneurship is not uh, for everyone and uh, entrepreneurship is not uh, an alternative of being uh, appointed uh, somewhere in the, within the public sector. So, uh, and it's not to, to open a coffee shop that will be closed uh, in uh, maybe three months and uh, the debt will be uh, read and the, the vendors will also uh, will have money to claim, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the basic problem uh, in, in Greece uh, was that uh, uh, entrepreneurship, the word actually entrepreneurship, had uh, in a lot of instances a negative uh, connotation because whoever uh, was uh, a successful uh, entrepreneur was conceived to be either a, a crook or uh, used, uh, let's say, unlawful uh, uh, tactics or made some special uh, arrangements with the, uh, the various uh, governments, etc., etc. So, uh, and this is also our uh, effort within the Hellenic Entrepreneurs Association to educate people and uh, explain what exactly is entrepreneurship and what is the role of entrepreneurship in the country's uh, revival. Because uh, I firmly believe that uh, it's, uh, it's only the private sector uh, at this moment that uh, can drive the country out of, uh, of this uh, crisis. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, I think that um, people uh, during this crisis have uh, really understood and appreciate uh, the role of uh, uh, entrepreneurship. And I think that this change, uh, of course, it's taking time to, to change. And uh, those, uh, first of all, that uh, should change mind are the, our politicians. Uh, so they need to understand and then uh, also give uh, the vision to, to the people. What's the uh, prospect of Greece? What is the way to go uh, forward? But this uh, vision also needs uh, leadership. And uh, the problem, I think, uh, and I will conclude with this in our country, is uh, the lack uh, of uh, leadership and vision that the uh, state, uh, the state side does not have, uh, but at the same time, the private uh, sector has.
Thank you. Nico? Well, I'm not sure I have uh, too much to add. And I'm not certain I have analyzed properly the Greek um, demographics and the way people feel about entrepreneurship. Um, I think one one part of the problem is that uh, you know this leftist uh, mythology that uh, entrepreneurs and people in business in general are there to just drink the blood of poor people. It played a role over all these decades, maybe after uh, the government that we have now, maybe this mythology comes to an end. Uh, who knows? And then public sector plays a huge role, enormous role in people's you know, attitude against you know, uh, labor, how they f see themselves in working. So usually people go with easy solution. If there's a public sector with a, this clientele system that promises you an easy job, uh, without meritocracy, but just having someone to connect you with a public uh, job, that's a good way to go to fix your life's problems, and that maybe is a uh, reason also to uh, have people hostile against, against the entrepreneurs or this way of living. Okay, thanks. Perhaps my uh, second and last uh, question. Uh, from the reports we read about the government's um, economic strategy for after August. Uh, according to the newspapers, there's reports about uh, re-establishing the principles of collective bargaining. Uh, there's also uh, references to uh, restoring social justice. With those things in mind, are you confident that this is a plan which is business friendly, Mikali? That's a good question. Re-establishing the collective, uh, collective agreement or the collective bargaining. Uh, this, this depends how they will do it. And okay, it's uh, to what extent they will uh, they will leave freedom and they will leave, they will pass the power to the to the unions. Uh, if uh, it's balanced towards one side, then it will run again into troubles. So we'll have to see what they will do. Okay. Vasily? Well, I will uh, s simply comment that um, as things are today, we, in, in, in my company, the Athens Medical uh, Group, we employ uh, 3,000 uh, people. So it's only uh, 50 people out of the 3,000 that are just with a basic uh, salary. But at the same time, if uh, such a process uh, you know, is uh, restored, uh, then it, it, it would be a problem. Nico, are, uh, are you confident about the, a business-friendly program coming from this government? Not at all, it's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> no. and I don't think this is a, the big questions we have to, to face as a society. It's, uh, you know, big questions are in a totally different place. No. It's nothing to do with what we need to do. Okay, okay. So, we can now open it up uh, to the audience. Uh, there are colleagues with the red T-shirts with microphones who can come uh, to you. Could you simply say uh, who you are and then uh, briefly ask your question? Could we take the gentleman halfway up uh, here, please? Uh, thank you. Um, Manolis Galignanos. I'm a professor of economics at the Royal Holloway uh, University. Uh, I have a question for uh, Mr. Drandrakis. Um, his uh, observation that uh, it's very difficult to find qualified workers is a surprising one mm. uh, given the high level of unemployment in Greece, uh, especially among young people. So I wanted to um, ask him uh, what does he think is, are, the, are the primary reasons for that? So is it something that potentially his company could fix, like offering a higher salary, or is it that the prospects that workers find in working in Greece, as opposed to, say, coming here in the UK, that overall uh, employment prospects are, are worse. So this is something that, that doesn't have to do with his own company, but it has to do with the fact that there aren't many other companies uh, to which a worker could possibly uh, move on later on or, or, or something like that. And I think this has to do with the, uh, what you mentioned also about uh, whether it is possible to, de to develop talent within Greece. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Nico? So I think we could solve this problem with the lack of labor. Um, well, obviously, we can offer higher uh, salaries, and we do already, although it's hard to compete with uh, 
companies like Facebook London or Google uh, Geneva or because these are the companies that are you know, competing for our talent. Uh, but given that even if we manage to compete on, on salaries, again, you have a trust issue. So we're talking with people, uh, trying to attract them to work with us. And all they say, you know, across the whole interviews we, we, we do is, what's going on with the situation with your, the, your regulatory battle? Is your company closing? Um, is the government going to shut down your company? And this hostility against, you know, companies like ours um, is something that is really hard to overcome and attract talent. So it's much bigger, you know, the environment, the feeling, the way you, the way people perceive uh, how we operate here. It's not just a money issue, it's much bigger. Unless we solve it, uh, there's no way we can just put money to the problem. Other questions, please. Could we take the lady at the front? Dr. Evelyn Stefanaki, I'm a dermatologist living and working in, in London and currently we have a great number of very accomplished doctors uh, living and working abroad and offering their services not to the people of their own country. Um, so the question is mainly to Dr. Apostolopoulos as a CEO of Athens Medical Group. Tell us a little bit about medical tourism and how that could potentially help the Greek economy. The second question has to do with a very recent legalization of the use of cannabis for medical use in Greece and how could that affect the pharmaceutical industry and as an extension the Greek economy. Okay, thank you for your uh, question. Um, I couldn't comment on cannabis. I'm uh, a doctor, uh, not a medical doctor. So, <laughs> uh, uh, no, coming back to your uh, first um, first question. Well, yes, but it has to be scientifically proven, uh, and uh, then there is a big debate that I cannot uh, uh, follow. Uh, so, indeed, medical uh, tourism, uh, and that was uh, identified early enough back in uh, 2012. Uh, there was a survey by McKinsey ordered by the Greek government, and uh, it presented medical tourism as uh, one of uh, the key pillars uh, that could potentially give growth to, to the Greek uh, economy. Uh, unfortunately, not much uh, has been uh, done at uh, the legislative uh, level since, uh, since then. Uh, and we, we try, uh, but uh, we, we do it mostly on our own uh, efforts and uh, devices uh, to uh, promote uh, our country, uh, develop the brand name, because Greece yes, is very well known for its uh, touristic uh, product, but it's not uh, known as a medical uh, tourism uh, destination. So uh, it's a tough exercise. Uh, as a group, uh, I believe we are quite successful, and we hope that uh, uh, the proportion of our uh, uh, turnover coming from uh, foreign patients will grow year on, uh, on year. Uh, but I will give you just an example, a handicap uh, that we are facing. Uh, we have a VAT rate of 24%, uh, where our uh, competitive markets uh, is uh, single digit or even uh, zero. So you understand that uh, we have a lot of uh, obstacles to, uh, to, to get over, but uh, in the end of the day, I think that we have a very competitive uh, price to quality ratio uh, that uh, we can use and uh, become in a few years time, because this is, uh, it takes a lot to, to build. It's, uh, it, it, will be, it will eventually become an important uh, part, and of course, it is uh, to our interest through this uh, uh, effort in, in medical uh, tourism uh, also to attract back uh, uh, talent uh, like yourself. So uh, we hope in the future to be uh, able to give you the, the grounds. And this is what we have been doing uh, all these uh, years, not only to stop the, the, the brain drain, but reverse it and uh, make it a brain gain. Thank you. Other questions, please. Could we take the lady almost at the back? Thank you.
Thank you very much. I have two uh, specific questions. One would Could have you to do... Just tell ev everyone who you are. Oh, sorry. My name is Irene Martin. I teach political science in the Autonomous University of Madrid, but currently I'm visiting fellow at the Hellenic Observatory. My question has to do to, uh, with to what extent do you think that some of the causes for this lack of attraction to investors have to do with the message that comes from outside Greece, the fact that it is not clear what is going to happen with the debt relief, for example, or in the past, the message hasn't been clear about uh, whether Greece was following the correct path or not. So I suppose many investors who don't know what is happening in Greece uh, from first hand experience uh, will will take this into account and how how do you think this is going to look like from august on and the second question has to do with uh, collective bargaining i wonder if when you all of you were very skeptical about it I if what you meant was collective bargaining itself or the way it is done in greece and whether it has more to do with collective actors in a way than with the institution of collective bargaining because collective bargaining exists in many countries that, atta that attract investors. So I suppose it's not the institution itself and maybe it has to do with the fact that there is no, no culture of maybe negotiating and giving up some things but it's more a, a zero-sum game. I don't know okay. what you think about it. Thank you. Mikali, do you want to start with that? As I said, no, collective bargaining, the, the institution, let's say, or the practice is not a wrong one, it's a, a right one. And uh, uh, when the rules of the game are equal, equally balanced for both sides, then it's fine. The problem we had in Greece with, uh, with the unions in the past was that uh, the unions were not mature enough to, rea to, to, do, to accept that they had to compromise. So they were, uh, ma they were trying to maximize the benefits they had. Part of the problems that we, uh, we faced in the last 10 years are problems that have, had been created in, uh, in the 30 previous years because of the collective bargaining extortion or blackmailing that was taking place uh, over the years. So. Yes, I'm in favor of, uh, of having a collective bargaining uh, institution in Greece, but at the same time, we have to make sure, that the officials have to make sure, the government has to make sure that this is equally balanced and it gives power, the, the power is equally balanced. You cannot have the power uh, shifted in, you know, on one side, because then we'll run into problems. Thanks. What about the other part of the question, that uh, FDI in Greece may be uh, lower because Europe is giving a very negative image about the uh, negative message about the uh, future debt relief, uh, etc. Allow me to to share to you my experience that I have. You know, running a company which is mm. also part of an international or international organization, but also by by talking to uh, in foreign investors. One of the, there are a few, a few uh, factors which are very important for foreign investors or foreign investors, and these are the, m mostly the taxation, the regulatory and the legal uh, environment. If you know that you have uh, 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 stability in this environment, so you, have, you don't have any surprises from you know, year to year or for uh, every six months, then you're prone to invest or you consider investing in one country. If you're not sure, what, what comes in terms of regulation or, or laws or uh, taxation, uh, then you, just, you, know, you, you, you make your decision, you decide to go to invest in another country where the things are, more, uh, itchy, are much easier to, to forecast or to predict. So predictability or uh, stabilization of the, of the environment is a very important factor Thank you. Okay. for investments. Other questions? Oh, suddenly, <laughs> as we come towards the end, there's a crescendo of arms going up. Okay, could you sh show your arms again? Put up your hands again. Uh, okay, could we take the gentleman right at the very back in the red shirt? Here. Oh, I'm sorry. You will come back to you. Perhaps we can take a group of questions now. 
Hi, my name is Mike. I work uh, in the tech industry, and I would like to ask me the, Mr. Dandrakis. Uh, what I find really remarkable for, for your company is how competitive you stay in a global market, how you found the markets you, know, you focus, and you stay fairly competitive in those markets. So I'm wondering if that's something down to the individual entrepreneur, or if it's something that you know, policy can influence so more companies find their markets internationally um, and stay competitive there, because that feels you know, a, a big theme behind uh, making competitive companies uh, abroad. Is that something you know, down to a personal entrepreneur level, or is that something that policy can influence according, according to you? Okay, good. We will take the gentleman now at the front, please. Thank you. Uh, Dimitri Mournudis from another um, organization with the Hellenic, uh, in front of it, Hellenic Engineers Society of Great Britain. Um, Excellent uh, panel tonight. Two questions. Uh, the first one is on education. We keep talking about uh, the lack of entrepreneurship and the uh, statistics that uh, Mr. Lois has uh, put forward that the young Greeks are uh, scared of starting up a business. Don't you think it has to do a lot with the, um, education, starting from uh, primary school? Only specialist um, students will do economics. There's no discussion about personal finance. Uh, that's why we're hearing a lot in the news about uh, people not understanding what they're signing up to as far as loans, um, personal loans, etc. And the second question is, uh, Greece is fantastic at talking about the past, be it 25 centuries ago or 200 years ago. At the moment, there's no discussion about what's gonna, where Greece is going to end up in the next 15 to 20 years, uh, taking into account that new technology um, is going to make many jobs obsolete, presumably even taxi drivers, um, in the next uh, 15, 20 years. Where do you think specifically are the um, topics, the um, industries that Greece should be focusing on, which will produce high paid jobs? Because tourism in general will not, and agriculture definitely not. Okay, good, Thank thanks. You. We had some people in the middle. Uh, could we take the uh, gentleman in the white T-shirt, please? Um. Henry Chamberlain, a student from Eltham College. You're talking about um, like the loss of talent in Greece and then there's also the issues of corruption and um, uh, poor regulation. So what is it specifically that the Greek economy can offer like foreign investment to make sure it gets this growth and what like areas um, can Greece really specialise in to um, ensure that they um, get this economic growth that they need? Okay, and perhaps just one last question. Uh, the gentleman in the dark T-shirt. Thank you. Oh, sorry, you made a note. <coughs> so essentially, uh, I'm first of all, uh, Vasilis Lambre. This is one of the data engineers Nick was uh, talking about. But uh, my question is probably more directed to uh, Dr. Vasilis. And uh, if I remember correctly, you're a member of SEV. Yes. Yeah. So essentially, I hear an impossible situation where the public sector needs, which is the most dysfunctional part of a system, needs to lead the change. And my question would be what are the initiatives of the private sector, and especially institutions like SEV or EVE and similar uh, structures, to essentially restructure themselves and rebrand towards the public and reach out and strengthen the voice from? directed from the private sector in order to leverage positive change towards the public sector and lead a more positive interaction between the private and the public. And I guess it's worth mentioning the precedence of like benefactors. The, there is a strong culture of uh, big families benefactoring in Greece. Uh, and okay, how can I could, we uh, make that? I couldn't hear all of that, but the, uh, essentially the question is what can the private sector do what to can the leverage reform of the public yeah, how uh, can sector and the institution? How can both leaders in the private sector lead change? Okay, you know? okay. Uh, <coughs> Nico, do you want to start with the first question, which was essentially whether success in the IT sector is essentially a question of uh, leadership qualities or of uh, the right policy uh, framework. I guess it's a question, Nico, as to how modest you wish to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, obviously, it's all about the entrepreneur succeeding and doing uh, 
delivering uh, a result, regardless of policy. And um, you know, the hard truth is that if you're an entrepreneur, wherever you live, you have a mission just to succeed, you know, deliver. The companies um, expand or whatever your goals are to, because you take into account where you live and where you operate in, so you count everything and then you have to, you know, work under certain circumstances and deliver. Otherwise, you give up and you just join a company. Uh, but policy obviously helps a lot, obviously. And that's why you see consistently successful companies in some parts of the planet and consistently failed companies or failed nations sometimes in other parts of the planet. So, yeah, policy plays an enormous role uh, for the big picture. But individually, obviously, the entrepreneur plays a role too. It's, it's, it's up to him, you know, whether he succeeds or not. Uh, given the environment here, but it's uh, in. Good, thanks. Uh, Vasily, do you want to uh, respond to the question about um, education? And uh, the particular question was about the need to perhaps to change the curriculum in schools so that people study economics and finance, uh, et cetera, and perhaps beyond sc the school level to uh, the kind of courses that students take at university. Um, are you optimistic on that front? Well, I think that uh, education, or to put it in another way, lack of education, is the number one problem in, the, in our uh, country. And I'm not talking strictly uh, about uh, the curriculum and uh, the syllabus, but I'm talking on the, on the mentality. Even uh, the obvious, uh, let's say, link between uh, the Greek universities and Greek corporates uh, that it should be there. Uh, there are political parties who still, uh, uh, which still uh, challenge this. Uh, so um, uh, education, I think, uh, it's in the epic center of uh, the, the change that we want to see in, uh, in our country. And uh, actually, uh, a big obstacle uh, today is uh, uh, the Greek uh, constitution. Uh, it's the so-called Article 16 that uh, forbids the creation of private universities. So I believe that uh, once um, this is uh, removed and competition is entered into the market, this will be benefic beneficial for the uh, Greek education as a, as a whole. The new competition uh, will also uh, attract uh, Greek uh, brains, professors from foreign universities that will come to the country and uh, will, uh, will, will change the, the mentality. Of course, uh, I just uh, replied on the uh, university level, the, the same applies to, to lower education, in the, even from the kindergarten that my son uh, attends. Uh, children need to know that uh, they, they, they should have uh, an ambition, they should have uh, uh, a vision, and uh, to explore their talents in, in, in the best way and not in the easy way. Thank you. Uh, I can't um, miss the opportunity to mention that um, I recall when Anna Dimandopoulou was Minister of Education and talking about university reform, she went around Greece and she reported back that uh, outside some of the universities, uh, the people who were protesters were holding signs, uh, no to aristia, no to excellence. Yeah. Uh, perhaps it says something about the attitudes. Uh, Mikhail, do you want to pick up on yes. any of those questions? There's a question. I, I like to add some um, some positive remarks. Let's not be. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, I think it's we owe it to the Greek people and uh, to what uh, they have uh, gone through up to now in the last eight years of uh, of the crisis. Uh, we're discussing here what should be done in order to, you know, to, to attract more uh, foreign investment. At the same time, we have to admit that a lot has been done, and a lot of uh, sacrifices have been uh, uh, taken, let's say, by, by the Greek people. In fact, uh, I would say that the crisis we have uh, had to go through Greece was the worst, even the, the crisis uh, to, in 1929. And uh, I would say that... Uh, uh, the reforms that have taken place in the last eight years in Greece uh, have been very harsh for, uh, for the, Greeks, uh, the Greek citizens. And definitely it was not their fault that uh, you know, the country has come to this, uh, to this uh, level. So I would say that these reforms that have been taken, uh, have been uh, uh, in place, are to, uh, the right direction. They have helped a lot 
uh, to start gradually going coming out of uh, the crisis. We have to make sure, and the government has to make sure that these reforms are not reversed, okay, like the collective uh, agreement we're discussing or, uh, for next year. Uh, but uh, uh, I would like to say that it's because of these reforms that I have managed, we have managed in our company to transform and, and previous state-owned company with the, all the, the diseases that the state-owned companies had into a, a very resilient and efficient uh, company which is supposed uh, to be, it's not something I'm, I say that, this is accepted by the, the international financial community, it's one of the most, or the healthiest, and the most uh, solid telecom companies in Europe. So it's, uh, and to answer to the, the question of the young person over there regarding, you know, where, where someone can invest in Greece, where is the foreign investment that could go to, there are many areas in Greece that uh, still, you know, offer opportunities. Uh, like the, the marinas area, the medical tourism area, the agricultural area. The, for me, this could become a, an organic uh, agricultural country, you know, in, in its totality. Because we have the weather and we have also the... the uh, it's a matter of having a vision and then, you know, translating this vision into a mission and uh, objectives and goals and whatever. So it's, uh, there are many things that have been done, even corruption that someone mentioned, has been tackled in, in many aspects. Uh, uh, but uh, one, one, one thing we have to all uh, make sure is that we don't become complacent. Thanks. If I may, uh, Michael, you mentioned there that um, the transformation of Ote had been helped by the kind of policies which have been undertaken during the crisis. And I guess there's reference the, to the kind of policies that uh, Europe, the Troika, uh, insisted upon. So logically, do we understand you to, to say that after August, after the end of the third uh, bailout, you would be more confident of a program which was business friendly if uh, Europe did indeed have, uh, whatever the phrase is, enhanced surveillance of the Greek case? That would, that would reassure you, rather than leaving uh, matters to the political choice of governments? Uh, okay, allow me not to make any statement on this. Okay. This is public, so I don't want to become uh, political, so. Uh, 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 okay, you, we, can <laughs> we can interpret the silence however you wish. Um, we are uh, now out of time. Can I, uh, first of all, thank our colleagues in the Hellenic Bankers Association for their uh, continued uh, support. <laughs> Can I also give a quick uh, plug for the Hellenic Observatory uh, and our public events program? Uh, after the summer, of course, we will be uh, having another program of public events in the next academic year uh, with, um, I think, some very interesting uh, public speakers coming from, uh, from Greece. So please do look at the website for the LSE Hellenic Observatory to learn about those as they are announced during the summer. Uh, but finally, can you please join me in, in thanking our three panelists uh, for this evening. Thank you.